Happy New Year! Hi, I'm Udoka. Welcome to my YouTube channel. This is how I'm going to play the intro. I mean, until I start editing videos. I'm just going to do it this way. Thank you for hopping on over. Hold on. How do I... There used to be a pause button. I'm using OBS live stream. There used to be a pause button. There's no more pause button. So we have some technical difficulties, right? The audio isn't how I want it to be. I got to figure out how to do all that. Hold on. Well, welcome to the channel. This is where I talk about like whatever I want talk about my thoughts on my life and other people's lives as well. And I wanted to react to this one video. Hold on. Nope. That's not, see, I don't know. Why did they get rid of the pause button? Really, why did they do it? Why did they just wanted to mess with me in 2022? They wanted me, they wanted me to learn how to use computers in 2022. I wanted to react to... This video I saw um, about a woman named Molly May. I actually have no idea who she is, but she's famous enough for this YouTuber, Uncle Herman, to make a video about her. Apparently she made a statement that was very hustle culture. And I used to be, is there, is there lipstick on my teeth? I don't think so. I used to be incredibly hustle culture, honestly, since I was 13 years old. I was hustle culture, hustle hard, <laughs> um, overachieve, get more, get more. I used to really, really be about that life. And I am not like that anymore. I'm not like that anymore. The reason I'm not like that anymore is because um, I burnt out. I talk a lot on my channel about the, my depression, ADHD, the anxiety, both of these things can cause. And um, hustle culture really true. I never thought I had anxiety <laughs> until I finally burnt out on hustle culture. Um, so I wanted to watch Uncle Herman's video and share my thoughts as somebody who used to be all about hustle culture. Like I used to really, I used to really believe if you work hard enough, you'll get whatever you want. I used to really just think it was that simple. And that's what everybody would say. All of the role models, they would say that. It was they just work hard. But now I'm older and wiser, and I know there's more to it than just working hard. I remember I would ask these people, I would ask these gurus and teachers and role models, I would ask them, you know, I would go to Tony Robbins, go see Tony Robbins, see if I can go talk to him in person. And just, I just wanted to know, hey, you know, why is it that there's a lot of people who work really hard? You know what I mean? Like, there's a lot of people who work hard, but not everybody is Beyonce. Not everybody gets the same reward. And these people could never give me a straight, real answer. The answer was, Udoka, you just need to experience life and let the answer hit you in the face. So let's dive into Uncle Herman's video. Got Uncle Herman here and I'm still an alpha male. Recently Molly May has been in the news for saying- audio is janky. Like, 
Let's see what we can do. That everyone has the same 24 hours in the day, and therefore, if you just try hard enough, you can be successful. Beyonce has the same 24 hours in the day that, that we do. You're given one life, and it's down to you what you do with it. Like, you can literally go in any direction. The world is literally our oyster, and we can do whatever we want with the 24 hours in the day that we're given. So why the hell am I not going to go out and, like, make the most of them and do crazy things and make the most, like, as I said, make the most of it? If you want something enough, you can achieve it, and it just depends to what lengths you want to go to get where you want to be in the future. If you've never heard of her, so that little clip of her talking, a previous me would be like, oh my gosh, inspirational. <laughs> and save it. I would save that video. So what she's saying, that that phrase, Beyonce has the same 24 hours in a day, in like the 2010s, I think maybe 2015-ish, that phrase was everywhere. It was whenever Beyonce came out with Lemonade and all the music videos and she was at the Super Bowl and stuff like that. That phrase was everywhere. When it, I don't remember what year it was that it was Beyonce fever, but all the girlies, all the girl bosses, all the, you know, all the women who are ambitious, we were buying coffee mugs with Beyonce also has 24 hours in a day. And when that phrase first came out, I was like, oh yeah, that's true. And a part of my mind was like, well, Beyonce also has like people she trusts working around her. She, Beyonce has a team. Like Beyonce literally has a multi-layered team. Um, but yeah, she does. She does have the same 24 hours in I don't know why that that was supposed that was supposed to inspire us. But it had a grip hold on all the ambitious girlies it had a grip hold. Now when this Molly May says, you know, it's up to you what what are you willing to do to get what you want? That is that is a more relevant thing to talk about. That's the thing that these people, they don't want to actually talk about because what did you have to do? Okay. I am uh, training to audition for semi-pro and professional league dance teams, like sports dance teams. And this journey I'm on is really a journey of what am I willing to do, right? Because there's a couple of things against me. So what am I willing to do so that me can get on that team? Am I willing to change my hair, my teeth? Um, am I willing to uh, go down to a certain size? Am I willing to put in hours required to get my leg to touch my face? Listen, my leg is going to touch my face, okay? In six months, my leg will be touching my face in the air. How far am I willing to go? I told myself, I'm willing to go as far as my finances will allow, <laughs> okay? So I can buy the wigs. I can buy eye contacts, right? Because, hmm, we, we can't have too many black girls on the team. We can't have too many girls who look the same on the team. Well, okay, I can be the black girl wearing the loosely curled wig. I can be the black girl who has hazel eyes, green eyes. Um, I get, however far my finances will take me is where I'm willing to go. I hired a private gymnastics coach. Teach me how to do that one thing. Teach me how to do that one thing so I can just do pull it out in the audition and have to and be on the judges' radar. But when you look up like <laughs> when you look on YouTube, oh, what are tips and tricks for making it to an NFL dance team? They'll say things like just be yourself, just show your personality. Um just and it's like, no, actually, that's not, actually, actually, if you just be yourself, I guarantee you won't make, I guarantee you're not going to make a thing. So out of everything she said, the 
thing that's most true is how far are you willing to go? Because you do, you have to go for, for, because how far you have to go to get what you want is different depending on the person, right? If I was a white woman with red hair or auburn hair, um, what I would have to do is different than being the, the black girl with type four hair. Do you get what I'm saying? I hope I, I hope that makes sense, right? The reason I chose white woman with auburn hair specifically is because that's how you stand out as a white girl. You, that's that that makes you stand out, and they want they they will if you have red hair. <laughs> Listen, if you if you've been a dancer, let me know. Let me know. Am I lying? If you are a white woman with red hair, when they see you, they are praying to God you can dance because they want you on the team. Because it's just it's a rare look. It's a look that that's just what they want. Okay. Do you get what I'm saying? Different people have to what they have to do, what they have to sacrifice is different. So that's the truest, most most um what's the word you get what i'm saying that's the truest part of what she said b may is an influencer who became famous after appearing on the reality dating show love island since the show she's been the subject of a number of controversies and scrutiny online and unfortunately an internet hate campaign against her both before and during her most recent incident it's worth mentioning that okay so people are actually hating on her for what she said, that's really wild to me because what she said, people say this all the time. Like Gary Vaynerchuk has a whole platform on this. Like, I don't know. I, I need to dive deeper into it because I'm just wondering, maybe this is just, is it misogyny at play? Is it just a type of people who watch her are, are just not the type of audience who like this message? Why would you hate on somebody for saying something that is just, I, I think there's a lot to discuss in what she said, but I don't think it's deserving of hate. People say these things all the time. People f find these things motivational. So that's odd to me. Um, were they hating on her for her body looking like this? Hold on. Let me listen. In the past, she's been targeted a lot with people commenting on her body and her looks. And I just... That's horrible. No, I don't know what's going on. I don't know what this fandom, whatever this group is. Her body was normal. That is a... That is... That is the body <laughs> of a normal woman um, with... Yeah, she probably fits in the normal BMI. Um, people are disgusting. People are stupid. <laughs> like, do how what what percent of body fat do they think women are supposed to have? So already, who whoever these people are who are talking about this woman, I already kind of don't like the group. I kind of already side eye this group who talk about her. Past, she's been targeted a lot with people commenting on her body and her looks. And I just wanted to bring this up because when this was happening, I was completely on her side. I really felt for her and the negative attention that she was getting was very unjust. You're literally plummeted into this new world of, of trolling and, and every single person on this planet has an opinion of you. And you're kind of having to just sit back and say, okay, like, that's okay for everyone to have an opinion of me. And I think what happened on holiday, I mean, I, it's happened to me many times before now and you do just kind of get used to it as sad as it is and it kind of becomes mm -hmm. a normality and normal to kind of have things said about like that about you um it doesn't get any easier it doesn't at all but i think for me like i'm lucky that i've got tommy and that i'm quite thick skin because i always say that if it was happening to another girl yeah i don't know what that's like to be to be i don't know what you call this you're famous but you're not like superstar famous where you don't see your instagram you you have your finsta with your friends and that's what you look at in all this other public facing stuff you have no idea what people are saying because you don't you don't update that i don't what is it like to be the kind of famous where it's still you looking at all the stuff that is really tough that is really <laughs> 
Like I really, you know, I really say kudos to these people for finding coping mechanisms and healthy ways to protect themselves psychologically. Girl. I would worry for their mental health. I would worry for them. And so I'm certainly not here to point out Molly May's flaws or try and cancel her or anything like that. But I would like to talk about the wider discussion that has arisen from the clip of her. Let's talk about it. It's definitely worth success, discussing. Work ethic and privilege. The clip of Molly May that has gone viral is from a podcast that she appeared on recently called Diary of a CEO, where she was interviewed See, about her achievements. She's even she's on a podcast that is about hustle culture. So how, you know what I'm saying? Like, it's like, no, y'all just don't like this Molly person. Because if y'all really had an issue with what she said, you would take it up with the host of the podcast and every single guest that he's ever had on. Because they all are saying the same thing. Y'all just don't like Molly. That's something, this troll culture is so interesting to me. It's like, how do a groups of people usually t teenagers usually little kids and teenagers if, if i'm gonna be honest <laughs> that's what i think i think is little kids and teenagers um and i guess the occasional grown person who has nothing better to do with their time but how do you all latch on to one person and decide this person is our law cow if you don't know what a law cow is a law you're familiar with the term cash cow something that it's just gonna keep, just milk, milk it, cash comes out. You don't you don't stop, kind of like how a lot of drama channels and tea channels are talking about Trisha Paytas, she is their cash cow. Well, a lol cow is the same thing, but for lols, um, laugh out louds, lols, um, for ish and giggles. <laughs> so is she, they're law cow. Do they just this? They just hate her. They just anything and everything she does and says. Uh, they hate her. Like, what is it? And how did you pick her? Why her of all people? What did she do that was so bad or so annoying or so cringy? That's something that Uncle Herman doesn't really talk about in this video. And quite frankly, I I'm not gonna go investigate. But if you know, please leave a comment. Let me know. Let me know. Might talk about it on my podcast called That 5% with YouTuber and Honest Conversation. But let's press play. Achievements and becoming the creative director of fast fashion company Pretty Little Thing at age just 22. Think for me. Well, congratulations. Listen, okay. So that's what it is. Okay. Because these are the girls. She, the. So she is Instagram famous. I know she was on a reality TV show, but if you're reality TV and Instagram famous kind of go hand in hand. Uh, very Cardi B. Cardi B before she was Cardi B. She was uh, Instagram famous and she got on a reality TV show and that just translated to more Instagram fame. So, okay, she's Instagram girly famous. Um, and so she is now the CEO of Pretty Little Things. Pretty Little Things is a fast fashion brand. It makes a lot of money. Congratulations. The capitalist in me says congratulations at age 22. That is huge. That is a huge accomplishment. Um, now, here's why now I'm understanding what the issue is. Um, for, the, for the people who do follow the Instagram girlies, these fast fashion brands are problematic. Um, the working conditions of their worker. I mean, the same, you remember the criticisms people used to have of Nike and who and how Nike makes its products. Same criticisms for things like, for pretty little things, Fashion Nova, same criticism, except it's worse because they're trying to make the fashion even cheaper. Meaning the assumption is <laughs> that's just how much more exploitation there is. Not only that, they also steal designs and intellectual property from black women designers. It's very annoying. It's very, like, I wish, I wish we can just have, you know, a sticker or a logo that says, please leave black women alone. Like, leave us. <laughs> but anyway, so I, I'm starting to understand why they target her. 
have a very ordinary life. It, it sort of petrified me a bit. It was like a bit terrifying, this thought of, I don't want to grow up in this house. And and when I, I'm old in my rocking chair, I tell my grandkids, you know, like I had this really ordinary life and I had an ordinary job. I 100%, I identify with that. Um, it doesn't terrify me <laughs> as much today, but when I was her age and younger, it did. The idea of having an ordinary life made me want to hurl. It did. I was not about it. I was not about it. And if you're like me or like her, yeah, you're going to get sucked into hustle culture. I had an ordinary income like that. It petrified me from, I think. About, yeah, I just I hate the, I the thought of it. The thought of just being a regular person. I'm just like, no, that is not my passion. I was just like, no. Now, it could be, you know, might have something to do with my upbringing, right? I am an Igbo woman. If you don't know what that is, Google it. We are a tribe. We've been out here for centuries. And um, that's just kind of our culture. Um, our culture, people live ordinary lives, but in our culture, it is, it is expected that you strive for more, that you want more. Um, if you're in the United, if you are in, if you move to the Western world, if you move to the Western world, like the United Kingdom, the United States, whatever, Sweden, Canada, if you're over here, they kind of our culture is you should want more because you're in a place that can give you more. Feeling that way from about 15, I realized like. The world is literally our oyster and we can do whatever we want with the 24 hours in the day that we're given. So why the hell am I not going to go out and like make the most of them and do crazy things and totally like, as I said, make the most of it. So why not? Yeah, the world. Technically, the world is your oyster, right? If you exist, girl, what is happening with the screen? If you exist, then then you have a plethora of options available to you. So why not do crazy things? Doing crazy things is one of the options. Why not test your limits? I get what she's saying. And it's something I would have said. That's something I would have said when I was younger. Amy makes an interesting point here, saying that she never wanted an ordinary life, she always wanted more. This yearning for more, more wealth, to buy more things, to have more experiences, is a very individualist mm -hmm. and capitalist classic trap that and has a to trick people into. It's a never-ending cycle of wanting- Wait, who tricks people into? Classic trap that hustle culture can trick people into. It now, hustle culture didn't trick me into it, I already had it. What- what tricked me into it was Disney Channel, honestly, and seeing child stars, seeing child celebrities, seeing that, wow, there are kids my age who are just living the life and it's possible. And da -da -da -da. what tricked me into it is celebrity culture, is this all the attention we put on celebrities and things that they do outside of their craft. Like, when Ariana Grande is not singing, we're also concerned about who she dating. Where was she? Where she been? What, what, what does she wear? What cars does she drive? That is what tricked me into it, not hustle culture. I didn't know about hustle culture until how many, how many a decade later? Hustle culture was not a thing when I was 13 years old. So anyway, I'm just, I'm just saying hustle culture doesn't trick you into it. This is the society that we live in that kind of glorifies capitalistic success. That is what tricks you into it. It's a never ending cycle of wanting more, getting more, and then wanting more again. And it's a mindset that often leads to dissatisfaction and burnout. I remember when my goal was, I really want to get a million pounds in my bank account. That's all I wanted to do. I was like, that is my goal. And then oh my gosh, this girl is exactly how she thinks and how she feels is exactly me at that time. The minute I reached it, I was like, what I want to now. I want two million. And it's like, I never am happy with where I'm at. I'm constantly working towards the next thing but I think you need that you need that work I think you need that 
You do. If you want to reach the heights that she's reaching, you have to have that. In, it has to be innate. If you don't care about that, then you're not going to achieve what she achieved. You have to care about that. Dream collabs and it's just, what can I get next? One commenter on the original podcast wrote, This is a really interesting podcast. I appreciate her honesty and I deeply admire her work ethic. Personally, I can only dream of a work ethic like hers to be so driven and determined. Mm. However, I feel like with her determination comes a lack of appreciation. The segment where Molly talks about how she's never... I would agree with that. Um, you have to... When you have this kind of mind, the kind of mindset she has... And I'm assuming, I'm speaking from the standpoint of everything she says, I completely identify with it. So when I felt the way she did, it did come with a lack of appreciation. Not that I would ever admit it or say I'm not grateful or anything like that, but I, I wouldn't, I, there is no stopping to smell the roses. Okay, you're... You're, you're proud of yourself, you're happy momentarily, but you're just constantly, you're, it's like you're on a treadmill, you're just, you just keep going, you don't stop satisfied and wants more although that's all well and good it worries me how it seems like she doesn't understand that what she's achieved and the opportunities that she has are what people could only dream of what i mean by this is when she said when i got one million pound in my bank account it wasn't enough for me and i wanted to okay. this rubbed me and i'm sure lots of other people the wrong way and it worries me that her drive is solely based see this is where i differ um her saying i got a million that wasn't enough for me i want to that I don't have a problem with that. She can want to. She can want what she wants. And go get it. You know what I mean? I am... Um, after my burnout, I've been trying to better understand the type of people who will leave a comment like this. Because, like, intellectually, I'm like, yes. But the emotional aspect... Of people like this I agree with people like this intellectually emotionally I still feel like I don't relate like I will I will never some if I hear somebody say a million wasn't enough for me I want to I will never be like that will never upset me that doesn't upset me so okay let's keep going on money and materialistic things. This came across to me as a very capitalistic mindset and it just concerns me that she might be influencing young people to focus their energy on constantly making money rather than finding happiness. Okay, I see where they're going. They feel like it's an or over glorification of materialistic things. Um, Maybe it materialistic as in money, right? Because... Money, money does more than just buy you items. It also buys you more time because you can hire things out. It buys you health. It but girl, think back to when you were a kid, okay? Imagine your parents were rich. Or if you ever had rich friends, think about how things were so different for them. If you chipped your tooth, how long would it take for you to get your tooth fixed? Or maybe you just gonna live with a chipped tooth. Whereas your rich friend, they're going that day. They're going to see the dentist that day. Everything paid for. And they, they're going to the the night the nice dentist, the, the one for kids where the even the outside looked like Chuck E. Cheese, and then the inside they got all these kind of stuff in there. You know what I'm talking about. You know what I'm talking about. I remember, oh my gosh, so I had uh, this rich friend. I mean, I guess we're still, I mean, we're family, fr we're from the same tribe. So, you know, whatever. So, um, I'm just like looking at how they live because her parents are rich. Okay. And even, it was even kind of that one little scenario where her mom was like, Oh, let me buy you a gift since your mom couldn't buy it for you. And at the time my mom was like, no no we are going home thank you very much but i was like wait i want to i want i want the thing but now i'm like oh, okay 
That's low. It's like let's low key shade. That's low, it's low key shade. Like mm, I get it. I get it now. But she had like this suitcase that's like three hundred dollars. You know, a little suitcase that's three hundred dollars because it has like a Wi-Fi thing in it and USB port and this and that. And she was like, mm -mm. I was like, oh wow, what kind of suitcase is that? Oh, it's that suitcase that's on Instagram. Um, oh, I'm like, how much was it? Oh, I think it was like 350. I think she had like three of them. And just how normal, expensive things were. American Girl dolls, okay? Y'all remember American Girl dolls? I wanted one so bad. I never got one. But I would dream about it. I would, they would mail in the catalogs and I would keep, I would have a stash of the catalogs to just look at it and dream and fantasize about playing with these dolls and their cute little, they would have cute little items that worked. Like the computer lights up. Oh, it's just so cute. Like the coffee, the drink, like you turn it over and the little tiny drink empties out. It's so cute. Okay. I just had regular Barbies, not even Barbie, not even Mattel Barbie, dollar store Barbie. You know, the ones that smell weird. You know, the ones that are like cheap plastic and the line down her leg is like so spiky. Like they couldn't, they, they couldn't afford to shave off that excess plastic and it, and it smells so weird. It has a weird smell. Those were the kind of Barbies, <laughs> those were the kind of Barbies I played with. Okay. And the American Girl dolls, they're at least a hundred dollars, a hundred and ten dollars for just the doll, not even the accessories, clothes, house, all the stuff you want to buy. And for rich kids, the parents can just buy it. Like the way my mom will go buy me a $5 smelly bob, Bobby, Bobby. Her name is not Barbie. Her name is Bobby. <laughs> Bobby. That's the way the parents are just buying American Girl dolls and accessories. So why did I get on this rant? Um, I guess what I'm trying to say is money... To me, money is not just materialistic, though it is very materialistic. And I, I'm giving the doll thing as a materialistic example, but it, uh, it does give you the kind of life that is free of a lot of struggles. Like there's just a lot of struggles and worries and fears that you simply will not have to worry about because you're rich, because you have money. Um, I don't think that aspect of money is shared enough. It's not viral. It's not, that's not what people want to see. That's not what's tantalizing people. Like I have a million dollars in my healthcare fund. So if anything happens to me, I can get the best treatment possible, stress-free. That's not, that's not cool. That's not going to go viral, but that's what money can do for you. Another thing to point out is the questionable ethics of the company that she works for represents Pretty Little Thing. Pretty Little Thing is a notorious fast fashion brand owned by Boohoo that for a long time now has been scrutinized for paying workers low wages and providing unacceptable working conditions. It baffles me that Molly May seems completely oblivious to the amount of workers that are exploited daily by the very company that she signed a £500,000 deal with. Well, you kind of have to. I don't think she's oblivious to it. I don't think her accepting the CEO role means she's oblivious to it. She knows about it. Um, we all know about it. Um, I feel like it's just been accepted as a necessary evil. Because everything we have... Th this computer I'm using has the same issues. My phone has the same background issues the clothes i'm wearing the this ti 83 cal plus my ti 83 plus has issues there's environmental issues that the stuff used to make this um is causing damage to the earth when, if i were to throw this away this is not throwing this away is not good for the earth like these issues there's so many issues. 
She knows about them. And I feel like, but people, we don't bring it up every time. Like every time, if you go to the shoe store to buy some new running shoes, like you're not going to be like, oh, by the way, let's not forget, let's not forget the, the people overseas who have really bad working conditions that made these and then buying right now. Like, you don't, people don't do that. So, um, maybe we should, maybe we should. I just feel like y'all know, like, don't play, y'all know she knows, you know, she knows. I think what you just said is actually the key to why I've become successful in what I do is because it is so strict with what I do take on and what I don't take on. My days are planned out to like the nth degree. Like it is so particular what work I'm doing and everything is done with such thought and like such um, understanding behind it. Like I'm never taking on work that I don't understand or posting things on my socials that I'm not 100% behind or using. Like I think that is the key to being successful in in this industry and influencing, if you want to call it like it's it's, knowing what you're doing and knowing what you're talking about is is gospel like you're, you use those products you you stand behind what you're saying like i think that is why i've i have done well in what i in what i do because i am so believing in what i say and my, my followers know that like they they know that i'm not talking about something on my youtube unless i use it unless i i believe in it a report on ethical consumers reported that pretty little thing was marked down in the human rights category because its parent company boohoo was found to be selling clothes made by pakistani workers who earned 29p per hour according to a december 2020 article in the guardian it was also marked down for the leicester garment factory scandal an independent investigation published in september 2020 stated boohoo's monitoring of its leicester supply chain has been inadequate for many years mm -hmm. the investigation was carried out after claims that workers were paid below minimum wage as low as three pounds 50 per hour the investigation said allegations of unacceptable working conditions and underpayment of workers are not only well founded but are substantially true many large clothes company list the countries where supplies are located due to how sourcing from oppressive regimes and supply chain workers' rights abuses are yeah. common in the clothing sector. As neither Boohoo nor Pretty Little Thing disclosed the country of origin of its suppliers, mm. it lost half a mark under well, the consumer's human rights category. After Damn. watching the full interview. So it sounds like Boohoo knows what they're doing and they're just trying to avoid having to deal with it. Firstly, I do credit Steve Bartlett for asking really interesting and well thought out questions, as it is a really interesting watch if you have the time and want to hear about Molly May's career and her mindset. After hearing all that she had to say, I don't think that Molly May had malicious intentions with this statement. The quote you have. No, the fact that you would hear somebody say, you know, I want to do amazing things with the 24 hours in my day and make a lot of money. The fact that y'all would assume that's a malicious thing, I don't understand where that comes from. A lot of people want to make the most of their day and make a lot of money because that would make their life easier, funner, fulfilled, maybe their achievement focus, maybe there's like some complex they have and this will let them, you know, feel like they're the best, whatever. Like who, who do y'all feel like she's intentionally trying to hurt with a statement? I just feel like it, the statement is definitely worth discussing. Have the same amount of hours in the day as Beyonce is a staple quote of the girl boss lifestyle and community. You can find it on walls in Yeah, classes, that's what I was saying, mugs, girl. Mugs. Facebook Buying it's mugs. It's certainly not new, but it does point to a problem with the mindset that tricks people like Molly Mae into thinking that all of their success is due to their work ethic without mm. external factors such as privilege, yes. opportunity, background, and luck. So rather than malicious intentions, it seems that Molly Mae here is a little bit blind to her own privilege. One commenter wrote, The formula to success is not only hard work or hustle, but also luck and privilege. Yeah. Molly May doesn't seem to understand the latter and equates everything to her hard work. Yeah. An example of her privilege is... This is, this is why I stopped believing in hustle culture. Um, or anything that resembles hustle culture, right? Because this mindset of simply work hard, this mindset I've had since I was young. Um, yeah, somebody once told me, you know, janitors work hard. They're not winning Grammy awards. They're not, <laughs> like, a lot of people work hard. A lot of people work hard. 
And um, the problem I have is whenever I would meet with somebody in like whatever industry that I'm in, or if I just go to some motivational thing, or I happen to meet somebody who's a multimillionaire, um, I happen to, you know, whenever I'm in the presence of somebody who has the kind of financial status that I want, I ask them for some secrets. And... In the beginning, they would all say the same thing, just work hard, just work hard, and that's it. But then I learned how to ask better questions. And I learned how to develop like a little bit deeper relationship so they can give me the real tea. And um, they would start telling me the real tea. And that's when I really fell out of postal culture because it just made me realize these people know. I don't understand fully yet why they try to make things seem like it's so simple or so easy. Just work hard. I don't fully understand the motivation behind that yet. Um, and I know, I know um, Uncle Herman is going to talk about MLMs in a second. So obviously if it's somebody in an MLM, their incentive is to make you feel like you can join them. Um, I know like even outside of the MLM setting, if it's rich people on TV, the incentive is for you to buy whatever their product is. Or in the case of, um, I remember watching a long time ago, this Fox News segment of these multimillionaires who were, you know, trying to say, no, we can't increase our taxes. Don't increase taxes on us. And they would say things like, you know, I worked really hard for this money and this money is for my grandchildren and for my great grandchildren. And if you taxed me more, well, then that's eating into my grandchildren's money. You know, and that's not fair to my grandchildren. Like, you know, I have, I still have a family to take care of. They're like really talking like they are on food stamps and we're threatening to re and remove this food stamp program. And there was this one guy, he inherited a million dollars. So that's how he qualified to be on the panel. So he was like, actually, I'm completely fine with paying more taxes. Actually, I would love to pay 50%. I think, I think we should start paying 50% and I'm fine with that. And the other millionaires were like, oh my gosh, but what about did it? Did it what about did it? Did it? And then he was like, well, I inherited my money. And they're like, oh, you inherited your money. So you're, you're a silver spoon, baby. But it's like, yo, you also inherited money. You just learned how to make it into more millions. But you inherited millions too. And so obviously what was incentivizing them was, you know, allowing the public, us who are not millionaires, to be okay with multimillionaires paying less in taxes. Um, so the, uh, the speaking this way, it seems to always have a benefit. So I'm trying to understand how and why, you know, these people who it doesn't seem like a direct benefit, what is your incentive for putting on the charade? Like, why do you want to make us feel like if we just work harder, like, like you, um, we'll get the same thing. Like that doesn't, it, there's no incentive anywhere, but. They, they do, but they completely ignore that there is luck. And not just luck, yo. It's not just luck. It's like making deals with the right people. Making under under ta under the table deals. Um, you know, little, little tricks here and there. Girl, you know Elizabeth Holmes, the Theranos girl who's going to jail? Um, she didn't feel she was doing anything wrong because that is what they do. Like there's some scamming involved sometimes. There's scamming involved. Um, it's a lot um, of things. It's more than just working hard and the, obviously the privilege thing. Um, you know, like if you're a white man and you're trying to get angel investors, like please don't downplay the fact that being a white dude helped them trust you a little bit more. Um, like statistically speaking, they have more faith in a white dude. Bonus if 
you're associated with an Ivy League school at some point, even if you dropped out of said Ivy League school, you have a privilege, a an innate um, advantage that other people don't have. So what other people have to do is they have to figure out how to work around that, right? So like the ladies who started um, Birchbox or whatever, this that the monthly subscription that you get sent makeup, they had to figure out a way around the fact that we are females asking and inv- male investors asking them for money for something that they literally cannot comprehend. They do not understand that women like makeup and getting a monthly subscription of random makeup is more cost effective than buying makeup individually. And women are going to subscribe to this ish and make a lot of money. Um, they had to figure out how do you, how do you navigate that? You have an innate disadvantage in this space you have to figure you got to figure out game you have to play games you have to figure out the game so it's more than just working hard you do have to work hard most of the time sometimes you don't sometimes it kind of just falls into your lap but there's games involved and they always leave that out i don't like that being born as someone who lives up to society's standard of beauty, white woman, pretty and young living in the UK. She was born with the blueprint to succeed in this industry. I do feel like Molly has fallen into the hustle culture, but she will grow up and by her mid twenties will gain a lot more wisdom to hopefully be more humble and realize that life isn't a contest about what you can do with your 24 hours. Influencers and hustlers yep. like Molly. That's what I realized. So once I realized the truth behind hustle, the people who win hustle culture, yeah, I realized, you know, life is more than just what can I, how productive can I be? Because you can be super productive and then have nothing to show for it and you feel horrible. Not worth it. But she's not going to learn that lesson until later. Because she's winning, right? If she wasn't winning, then she would learn the lesson faster. But she's winning in her eyes. It's going to take something personal happening, like... Who knows? Like maybe uh, I rem- one lady, she was telling me, now I went to this conference. It was like this big women's conference. It was over Zoom um, because of, you know, the panorama. And this woman was like, I was hustling hard. You know, I was trying to make my way up in this company. I made, really, really made my way up in the company. And my mom was sick. And I had a meeting scheduled on Monday and she, my mom was begging me, please stay, just stay one more day because it was Sunday. And I said, well, I have a meeting. So on Monday, I left my mom and went to my meeting and I thought, you know, I'll just see my mom after the meeting. And then when I came back, she had already passed and they told me she passed an hour ago while I was still in the meeting. And ever since then, I told myself I will never again let a job, money, whatever. I will never again let a job keep me away from what is most important, right? So something is going to happen to her for her to realize, you know, maybe, oh, it's affecting my marriage, my relationship, my kids, Something will happen. Right now, she's not going to feel that. She, I mean, she'll know it intellectually, but she, it won't be implemented into her actual life because as of now, she feels she's winning. ...seem to have almost tricked themselves into thinking that working hard makes you successful directly. But often they- it's really annoying that they do that. Okay? Rachel Hollis. It's really annoying that they do that. Now, I... With Rachel Hollis, she's incentivized to make you think it's just her working hard. She's incentivized so that you buy her book. But I think, no, maybe you're right. Maybe this girl really just thinks she works hard. I don't think she does, though. I think she's just not saying everything, you know? So you, Because if she were to really say the real ish, as mad as people are now, they're going to be even madder. They're going to be so mad. <laughs> They're going to be really mad if she says the real ish. So this is the safest thing that you can say. The safest thing that you can say is work hard. 
They fail to acknowledge that there are so many things that can limit a person's success. No matter how hard people work, people's race, class and background all come into play here and so a main part of the uproar around Molly May is her lack of acknowledgement that being a white middle class conventionally beautiful woman plays a lot into her success in any industry, especially... Yeah, they're not going to come out and say that. They will only say it if asked. Um, so... You know, the interviewers needed to ask because these people, they will never, it's very rare because there is, there is this one like multi, multi-millionaire, I forget his name, but he talks about it like all the time. <laughs> he talks about all the time. I think he's from India. I don't remember, but he talks about it all the time, how he had certain privileges that helped him get to where he was. But for the most part, these rich people, they will never come out and say that. You have to ask them. Um, one time I was, uh, I went to go see Misty Copeland. Misty Copeland is this prima ballerina. She's the first black um, like ballerina to do Swan Lake or something like that. I don't know. She's like, of, of ballerinas, she's the most mainstream. At least she was. I mean, as time goes on, she's less and less relevant in the mainstream. But um, I idolized her, okay? I was like, oh my gosh, you did it. Uh, and for those of you who are like, what type of black was she? She, te I think she's technically half black because her mom, I please correct me if I'm wrong. I think her mom is half white, half black, and her dad is half white, half black, but both are phenotypically black and then they had Misty. So Misty is phenotypically black, but she is light skin, like, um, you know, lighter than my complexion. And so she had a Q and A and I asked her, do you think you being so light skinned had anything to do with your success as a black woman? And she was like, um, yeah, yeah. I don't know if I, I mean, the success I've had has been incredible and I've been breaking barriers, but I don't know if I would have achieved it if I had darker skin. And so that, and also uh, most of the people in the room were white people, right? Like what is a young black girl doing at an art museum to discuss ballet? Um, but I, I did see, I was like, <laughs> I was like one of the youngest people in the room barring little girls in tutus um and you know one of the darkest people in the room so i also realized maybe the people in this room are afraid to ask that question you know or maybe or what's more likely they didn't even know that that's a question to ask they didn't even realize oh she is lighter skin compared to other black people ah. <laughs> she didn't even so that taught me that these people will never say it she doesn't say it in her book she doesn't say well I was light-skinned black so you know that helped a little bit she doesn't say that in her book she doesn't say it in interviews she would only say it when directly asked and that's another thing I've learned about these rich people the one that profits off of looks there are plenty of examples of the influencer pay gap where black women are being paid as much as 75% less for participating in the exact same campaigns as their white counterparts Damn. on Instagram. This is explored in depth in an article that I will link below about the influencer pay gap. And this just scratches mm -hmm. the surface of the inequalities that people have to face in order to make it in any workplace. And people like Molly May's complete blindness to this is only exemplified when they use terms such as level playing field. Ooh. The show just sort of, it just elevated me. And then I think one thing i always say is that when you come off that show you're all on a level playing field and it's totally up to you where you go with it and i just knew that yeah you right go. girl you right she completely doesn't get it you really felt like you're at a level playing field we could she i understand what she's saying but the fact that she used that term says that she literally doesn't think about it she doesn't think about privilege um, no, you're not on a level plane. You're not on the same playing field as the people who don't look like you who came off the show. No. <laughs> so yeah, you guys are right. She doesn't. She literally doesn't think about these things. Just 
to levels no one had ever gone to. The mindset that if you work hard enough, you can achieve anything is a staple of girl boss MLM culture. Just keep working. The only thing in the way of your success is yourself. It's not just girl boss. I know Uncle Herman is a woman, so that's where her focus is on. But this hustle culture is not just MLM girl boss. This is, this is do a dude's business guys, stock guys, finance guys, dudes, sales, sales people, big companies, big companies, like this hustle culture is in a lot of places in business. It's not just MLM girl boss, like sell, sell lipstick from your own home. You know, it's not, oh, these essential oils are great. Make my home smell great. No, like this is permeating in a lot of spaces. It completely disregards the inequality in which people can get opportunities to achieve these things and it equates success to money and assets rather than happiness and contentment. It's the reason that mm -hmm. MLM culture has fooled so many and continues to because people want a way in. They want to know that they can grow their wealth with their own hard work. But the yeah. reality is that society is structured in ways that put people of different backgrounds at a huge disadvantage in terms of the opportunities that are given to them. A working mother of four on food stamps technically has the same hours in a day as a rich influencer but she doesn't have them for herself the more privileged you are the more opportunities you have and the less stress you have about where you're going to live or how you're going to pay your bills the people working in pretty little things abysmal conditions for three pounds an hour are likely working as hard as they physically can mm -hmm. but they do not have the same resources as exactly an and therefore no matter how hard they work they will likely never see the amount of money that an influencer like molly and Working hard is a detriment. There are jobs where if you work hard, you're hurting yourself, right? They'll start putting more tasks on your plate, things that you should be compensated for. They won't compensate you. You, you start messing yourself up. Like a lot of times as an employee, if you work hard, it's actually to your detriment. <laughs> So, mm. Be May gets paid for one post on Instagram. Yep. So let me know your thoughts in the comments. So, yeah, so, okay. I think the backlash is about the entire interview, not just that clip. That makes way more sense to me. <laughs> I was thinking it was just that clip of work hard. It's the entire interview. To me, when she said we're at a level playing field after that show, even if she does understand she has privileges, her using that phrase means that she doesn't think about it. She doesn't think about it or she doesn't know how those affect your opportunities in the media. But I will say that some people do work harder than others, for sure. I think we see it, I mean, I pay a lot to um, black musicians and I, I can see, I can see how one person is working harder than another person. I can see it, but then I can also see, well, somebody is really working their, their A off. They're really working their A off and maybe there's a reason who maybe there's a reason they're not getting what they deserve. I can see that too. So anyway, as somebody who was formerly a hustle culture person, I I will I will say I understood. Well, also I'm black, okay? Um so I had to understand this at an earlier age than someone like Molly ever would have to. But I understood that there were disadvantages and I understood that that's part of working hard is if there's a disadvantage, you have to work hard to overcome the disadvantage. Um, and I know this is kind of how a lot of guys think and feel because I know there are guys that if they watch this this video, they would be like, oh, just because I'm... 
just because I was born into poverty or just because of this, 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 you're saying I can't be successful. And I feel it's because we also have high, an expectation that men succeed despite despite disadvantages, right? I think that is an expectation put on men. And so like, what good does it do them to ponder? And maybe that's why the guy didn't ask the question. I don't know. It doesn't help them to ponder on, you know, what, what aspects innately set me back from my goals. It doesn't help them. What helps them is, let me just be so good they can't ignore me. Let me just grind it out harder. Let me just, that is what helps them to fulfill their societal role as a moneymaker in society. These are all very interesting things to discuss and think about. I think about them all the time, especially as somebody who, who plays into the capitalism game. You know, I am, I want to make as much money as possible myself. So I think about these things often. Don't fully come to a conclusion, but I figure, hey, I think there's people on YouTube who also like to discuss it too. I know over time I will come up with a conclusion. That's just how things tend to go for me. I think about something, I ponder it even for years, and then I figure out the answer I'm looking for. But what are your thoughts Leave a comment below. If you have nothing to say, leave a paw print emoji so we know you watch the full hour of this tea. Uh, subscribe if you vibe with me. Until next time, much love. Oh, and I am working on posting actual edited content. Just give me some time. I'm trying to figure out a schedule. I really am trying to figure out a schedule because when I tell you this dance thing has taken over my life. I am at such a disadvantage. I'm competing against women who have been doing kicks and flips since they were toddlers. Number one, I'm competing against them. Number two, I have to lose weight. Your stomach has to be flat and not thick flat. You get what I'm saying? Like not ushy thick and your stomach is flat. You need to be a certain size. <sighs> So I have to, so I have to focus on that. I have to work on my technique, my flexibility, my dance memory in retain in retention. My friend was like, I, my friend, I don't, he's probably not going to watch this, but he thinks being an older dancer puts you on a disadvantage. It doesn't at all. Well, as long as you, as long as you don't look like you have wrinkles and stuff. It doesn't. What puts you at a disadvantage is how your body looks and your dance ability. Being older puts you at an advantage personality-wise. <laughs> personality-wise, you're perfect. Diction, speaking, knowing things, you're at an advantage, but that is like 5% of what they're looking for. So this has taken over my whole life. I have to do weightlifting to get stronger and to get a certain physique. I have to spend time for flexibility. I have to spend time for gymnastics. I have to spend time for dance. I have to spend, like already, that's over four hours in the day. Do you get what I'm saying? So I'm like, where am I going to? And I do the podcast now on that 5%. I'll have the link below in the description. So I am trying to figure out when will I have time to actually edit videos. We'll get there though. Thank you for watching and listening to that rambling. Until next time, much love, much luck. Peace out.